in almost all sports, there is a clock. Football, basketball, hockey, soccer. The time is limited and the game is played within a limited amount of time. Everyone knows how much time is left. There's one sport that's different. Baseball has no time limit. It goes by the number of outs and the number of innings. And that's one of the reasons that baseball is my favorite sport. Now think for a moment, which is more like life? We all live our life by the clock, but none of us know how much time we have left. And so in some ways, in many ways, life is more like baseball, at least our individual lives. We all live by the clock, but we don't know how many innings we have left in this life. In the same way, when it comes to the playoffs, you need more time right after the season is over. The NFL plays a one-game playoff, but in basketball and in hockey and in baseball, you get to play a five or seven game series. You need more time to show who really is the better team. In a short one-game playoff, single elimination, that's pretty tough. Which is more like life? Well, in both ways, Life is like a short time and a long time to live. We always want more time. And tonight we come to the third of three parables where Jesus says you might have more time than you thought. The theme of all three parables is delay. The third one we're calling a far country, a long time. It is the third of three stories that have to do with delay. Jesus' point in Matthew 24 is that watch, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. There is no clock, no countdown, no one can know. Therefore, you need to be ready at any time, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, of course, the disciples expected it to be soon in their lifetime. But Jesus prepared them very meticulously that there might be and there will be a delay. So he tells three stories, the faithful and the evil servant, the wise and the foolish virgins, and the faithful and unfaithful stewards. The three of them can be taken out of context, especially the second two. But the third one we take out, all of them have to do with delay. So he says, when he comes to the faithful and the evil servant in Matthew chapter 24, the faithful and wise servant is the one who is master when he comes will find so doing. But if the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, why would Jesus say that? Because Jesus is going to delay his coming. In the next story, the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish, the bridegroom was again delayed. And then in today's story, Matthew 25, the parable of the three stewards, we know it well, but did you realize that in the context, it's about a delay? Because the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. Well, that means it's going to be a long trip. And he comes back from his journey after a long time, verse 19. Jesus is again preparing his disciples and us for a delay. So I want to look today at this parable of the story uh, of the talents, the three stewards, and see how it fits in the context and how it teaches us, warns us that Jesus coming might be delayed. Hi, my name is Pastor Jeff Hartman, First Baptist Church of Troy, North Carolina, and this is the 13th of 14 studies in Matthew 23 through 25, Jesus' teaching on the future, the destruction of the temple, and his coming. I want to compare the parable of the talents that we see here in Matthew 25 with the parable of the pounds that we see in Luke chapter 19. Similar story, but very different in the details. In Matthew 25, each one is given a talent, and in Luke 19, each one of the ten servants is given a pound. Now, a pound is a lot of money. It's a year's wages, let's say forty or $50,000, but a talent is 25 times that, 25 years salary. So a talent is a huge amount of money. We often look at this as about talents, things that we can do, but a talent is money, and this is how we manage money. There are three servants who are given differing amounts, five, two, and one. In the other story, there are 10 servants who are given the same amount. Each one is given one pound. 
They're different stories told at different times with different points. Jesus is saying in this one, the three servants are left with different amounts and all of us are gifted differently. Some have more money, some have less, some have more talent, some have less. And that picture is one thing. This is a story that Jesus tells after Palm Sunday on his last week and he's warning them about a second coming. The other one is told before Palm Sunday and there each one of us is given different talents, but each one of us has the same amount of hours in a day. Each one has the same opportunity in a day. And so they illustrate different things. The emphasis is different. But we're going to look at the parable of the talents today. And notice, first of all, in verses 14 and 15, the master's departure. The master's leaving. Jesus is warning his disciples, I'm not here to stay. I'm going. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to each one according to his own ability, and immediately he went out on a journey. Jesus wants us to know we can't know when he's coming, but he is going. And so as he has illustrated thus before in the other two stories, he says again, I'm going, and you don't know when I'm coming back, but it will be delayed. So he starts with, for the kingdom of heaven is like uh, a man traveling. I want you to link it with the last verse we saw in verse 13, the end of the previous parable. He makes the point. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. That's the point of parable number two, the bridegroom who was delayed. So the four connects this story with the last story. So this story goes with you don't know the day or the hour, and he is connecting the four, the kingdom of heaven is like, with this watch ye therefore. The point is not how you use your talents, it's how you keep on working while Jesus is delayed. So that's the link with the context. Now let's look, this man is traveling to a far country. Now you can go next door and be back in a flash, but you can't go to a far country without being delayed. And so you see the context fits exactly. In the first one, the master is delaying his coming. In the second one, the bridegroom was delayed. Here we don't see the word delay, but the theme is still there. He's going to a far country. He comes back after a long time. So the emphasis is, again, the third time, delay. But when he goes, I want you to notice, he called his servants and he delivered his goods to them. This is an important part of the story. What he does is a very honorable thing to them. While I'm gone, I don't want you to sit around, I'm giving you my money. I'm giving you my stuff and I want you to invest it, I want you to take care of it, I want you to use it. He places great trust in them and that's what Jesus is saying to disciples. I'm leaving but I'm giving you my spirit, I'm giving you my power, and I'm giving you my vision. I want you to win the world. He delivers his goods to the servants, and that's what Jesus has done to us. Notice he gives each one differently in this story. In Luke, he gives each one the same. We all have 24 hours in a day, but we don't all have the same number of days or years or hours. To one he gives five, to another he gives two, to another he gives one. There can be no question some of us are given greater assets, some are given greater talents, some are given greater opportunities. He judges us according to what we do with what he gives to us. But notice, he delivers his goods to his servants. He gives them differently. And the question is not, well, I didn't get what they got. What are you doing with your one talent? Or maybe you're a two-talent person. Or maybe you're one of the five. Make sure that you are being faithful with what you are blessed with. And then he says, he gives one each according to their ability. He probably gave the five to the one who he thought would do the best with it. He probably gave the one to who had less ability. Yes, we all have the same number of hours in a day, but we all have the same days. We don't all have the same gifts, and we are all different, but that's okay. God made us different, and he gives according to our ability. And then notice the end of the story. Immediately he went on his journey. When he goes, it's not just goodbye, sad, boo-hoo, we're going to miss you. This is their opportunity to shine. He's left them with his riches, with his wealth. And so this is the opportunity they have 
because he's gone. If a boss never leaves, he never allows his employees to shine, to do their job the way it's supposed to be done. So Jesus is going to leave, and this is a sad time for the disciples, but it's an opportunity for them. And every problem is an opportunity for us. We've looked at the master's departure. Now we're going to look, secondly, in verses 16 through 18, at the, ser at the servant's stewardship. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and he made another five talents. Wow. For him, the delay is an opportunity. The longer he's gone, the longer I have to invest and the more money I can make for him. He went, the master went, he went without delay. He didn't wait around. He got busy. He invested the money. He started early. And you need time to double someone's money. He doubled his master's money. And today, with even good returns, it takes about seven years to double your money if you get great returns. So he makes five talents with the five talents he has given. And then we see the second man who had received two gained two more also. He got exactly the same return, 100%. Who is Jesus going to reward more? No, they got an equal return. So the delay is also an opportunity for him. He also doubles the money he's given. But then there is the third guy, bless his heart. He who had received one went, and he didn't double it. He went and he dug in the ground and he hid his Lord's money. For him, like the evil servant in the first story, the delay is an excuse to do nothing. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's laziness, but he makes a choice, a foolish choice. It's easier, think about it, to put the money in the bank, right? He actually had to get a shovel out and work to dig and hide it. It would have been easier for him to take it down in the bank and put it into an interest-bearing account, even at 1%, or today's economy, a half of a percent. But this is a foolish decision. He hides the money. He does nothing. And notice the last phrase. This is what we got to notice. It is his Lord's money. All three of them are investing or hiding the Lord's money. We need to remember that it's all the Lord's we are stewards, and a steward is someone who takes care of someone else's things. A steward, a stewardess on an airplane takes care of you. A steward takes care of their master's estate or their master's money. But we have to remind ourselves daily, whose talent is it? Who gave it to me? Whose time is it? Whose treasure is it? It's all God's, isn't it? We have to remember that everything we have is the Lord's. I don't give 10% of my money to the Lord. I give 10% of the Lord's money back to the Lord. He lets me keep 90%. I don't begrudge the 10%. I'm thankful that he gives me what he gives me and lets me keep 90%. So after the stewardship, we come to the punchline, the third part, the master's accounting. The master goes, but the master comes back and there will be an accounting. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came. He did come. Jesus is coming. But it is after a long time. Remember I said, how long does it take double money? Now, unless you are speculating in Bitcoin or something, it takes about seven years. Maybe it's seven years. But Jesus is preparing his disciples for the long haul. I'm going to be gone. So invest over the long haul. Wise investment. And notice, I made an emphasis on this. The servants... Lord came. Jesus has been gone 2,000 years, but the point is, he is coming back. We do have an opportunity now while he's gone. The disciples are gone, but we are here today, and his delay is an opportunity for us. Delay is not a denial of his return. He surely is going to come, and there will be an accounting, but the great moment finally does come in all three of the stories. The delay doesn't mean the master's not coming back. The master's delay meant that they just came. And when he comes back, notice what he does. He settled accounts with them. If you are spending your own money, you don't need to keep receipts. But if you're spending someone else's money, I have a church credit card and when I buy something for the church, I have to turn in receipts. It's not my money. It's someone else's money and I'm responsible for it. 
and these stewards were spending, investing, or hiding someone else's money, and there will be a judgment. Hebrews 9.27 tells us there is one life, and after this, the judgment. There will be a judgment. There will be an asking for receipts. What did you do with the time and the talent and the treasure that I gave to you? There will be an accounting. So let's notice, first of all, the two stewards who did a good job, who doubled their talents. He who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, ten talents, saying, Lord, you deliver to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. He's bragging. He's excited. He's thrilled to be able to serve his master so. His Lord said to him, well done, some of the most famous words in the New Testament, well done, good and faithful servant. He doesn't ask us to be flashy. He knows what we've been given, and he wants us to be faithful with what we've been given. So he rewards faithfulness. God rewards faithfulness. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Out of proportion, enter into the joy of your Lord. And notice the second one came along, received two talents, came and said, Lord, you've delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more. He gives back all the money and all the receipts and the profit that he made, his Lord said to him, the exact same thing, well done, good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things, fewer than that other guy, I will make you ruler over, not fewer, many things, out of proportion, enter into the joy of your Lord. Give credit to the master. Both of them say, this is not my money, I took your money, I did what I could with it, but it's your money, and I didn't have anything to invest, so all of the proceeds go to you. There is equal faithfulness, and so there is equal reward. I want you to see that both of them say the same thing. They both recognize they received talents, and they both acknowledge you delivered to me two talents. They are both giving credit where credit is due. We need to recognize that all of the talents and all of the energy and all the passion that God has given to us is given to us by God, and we can't take credit for it. And notice, they said, I have gained, both of them say, I have gained. You gave me five, you gave me two, but I did something with it, the personal responsibility, the trust you gave me, and I doubled it. God has given each one of us talents and time and treasure, but what we do with it is our gift to God. And there is here the individual responsibility their faithfulness. What God gives to you is his gift to you, but what you do with his gift is your gift to God. And these stewards acknowledge that. So the master says to both of them, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we all want to hear when we stand before the Lord in eternity. We want to hear God say, well done. We want to be called good, but the way we get called good is by being faithful with what he's given to us. I want you to notice here that Jesus is not a real tough judge, that he doesn't picture himself as a zealous cop waiting to pounce on you for doing something wrong. Actually, he pictures himself as a loving pop waiting to applaud his child for the good job that they've done. Don't picture Jesus as a stingy judge looking to judge you. No, he wants to be the one saying, well done, good and faithful servant. And notice the reward that he gives to both of them You've been faithful over a few things. Five, two, I will make you ruler over many things. Not a steward anymore, but a ruler. It does tell us in Revelation that God will allow us to reign with Christ. And that's way out of proportion. Ruler over many things. And don't miss, don't pass over the last line. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Heaven is not streets of gold. Heaven is the joy of being with Jesus and the joy of being with those that we love. And it is joy. God made us for joy. He wants to fill us with joy unspeakable here in this earth. But that's what heaven is all about. It's about joy. So we hear the well done, good and faithful servant. But don't forget, enter into the joy of your Lord. And I want you to recognize that you can enter into the joy of the Lord now. You don't have to wait for heaven, pie in the sky, by and by. He came to give you joy now abundant life in the here and now. Yes, heaven will be much better, 
but don't miss out on the joy he has for you now. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We looked at the stewards who doubled their talents. Now let's look at the steward who buried his one talent. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. If it was just laziness, he would have put it in his drawer, or he would have taken it to the bank. But he did a lot of work. He dug a hole. He hid it. He watched over it. He kept it safe. And let's give him credit. He didn't lose it. He didn't blow it on some big, far-strung bet. No, he kept it 100%. He hadn't lost one bit. But look what he does. He tells us that his motive was not laziness. His, la his motive was fear. I was afraid of you. And actually, he slanders his master instead of saying, you were generous and you gave me five or two talents. He says, I knew you to be a hard man. He imagines this master to be what he is not. This man is not the zealous cop looking to pounce. He is the, he's the eager pop looking to applaud. But he looks at him negatively. And I want you to see here that it all starts with our theology. What do you think God is? A stingy, small God who wants to zap you the first time you sin? Or the graceful God of the Old and New Testament who wants to forgive your sin, who gave his son to die for your sin? You see, it all begins with our theology. What view of God do you have? This man, because of his view of his master, did the wrong thing. Behavior is based on your theology. Behavior is based on what you believe. What do you believe about God? Is he some distant God who doesn't care? That he's some meticulous God who micromanages your life and takes away all the joy in your life? He was afraid. So then, as a result of that, you know, I knew you'd be a hard man. So he says, I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. I was afraid of what you'd do to me if I lost a dime of all that money that you gave to me. I was afraid. Is it only one talent people who bury their talent? Unfortunately, no, there are some two talent people and five talent people who bury their talents. All of us are required to use the talents that we are given. If you're given much, much is required. If you're given little, less is required. But here it is the one talent man who was given according to his ability, who hid it. And he hid it because he was afraid. No one, he didn't lose it. No, he didn't steal it. And he thought he would get rewarded for that. But actually he's saying, it's not my fault. It's your fault. I was afraid of you because I knew you were a hard man. The other two were giving credit to the master. And this man was blaming the master for his fear, for his laziness, for his failure. So I knew you reap where you didn't sow. And so he does stand self-condemned. Look what the master says to him. The Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. He was lazy. He didn't want to work. But he calls him wicked because he makes a foolish and evil choice. He says, you knew that I reap where I do not sow. You know better. You knew. You knew there was a God. You knew you were responsible to God. You knew your deeds were evil. You are judged according to what you know. And so, he says, let me judge you based upon your words. You condemn yourself by your own words. You knew I reap where I don't sow. So you knew that I would require back not just my money. He's saying, you condemn yourself with your own words. You ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. So at my coming, I would have received at least back my own with interest. Give me one or two percent interest. Over seven years, that might be 14% in accumulating interest. It might have given them at least enough to cover for inflation. You ought to have deposited with the bankers. If you have no risk, there's no return. If you have little risk, there's little return. If you take great risk, there is the chance for great loss, but there's also the chance for great return. He said the least you could have done, there's no risk in getting a savings bond or putting in a savings account, right? But life is a risk. We can't bury our talent because we don't want to lose it. We have to use it. Every single profession 
is some kind of risk. If it's public speaking, some people that the greatest fear is public speaking. The farmer has to risk the seed and plant it in the ground. Sure, it may not grow. Sure, the rains may not come. The sun may not shine. The plants may die. But they have to risk planting and all that work because if they don't, there will be no harvest and there will be no food and there will be no profit. And let's talk for a moment about banking. Bankers are not uh, filthy, greedy thieves. If someone loans out money at interest, they're taking a risk and their risk is worth us paying them for. And so a banker has a noble profession. Without a banker, most of us wouldn't be able to buy a home on time. They risk money lending it to us. We pay them interest and when we pay them back, they lend it out to somebody else. It's a noble profession. And here Jesus is okaying the use of interest, not to your mother, your father, your children, not to a friend, but to loan money to a stranger. You're doing them a service, allowing them to buy something that they otherwise couldn't afford, and they are rewarding you by paying for your risk. And so it is not wrong to borrow money, especially for an appreciating item. It's probably wrong to run up debt Romans 13, 10, oh no man, anything doesn't mean you should never borrow. It means you should pay what you do borrow. But the point here is that it's okay to deposit your money with a banker and make some interest. It's probably a lot better than burying it in the backyard. So he says, this is the least you should have done. And in doing so, Jesus okays risk and Jesus okays charging interest when you loan out money. But look what Jesus says next. Therefore, take the talent from him, verse 28, and give it to him who has 10 talents. Wow. Talk about redistribution. Today, everyone's talking about taking one from the one with 10 talents and giving to the one who has only one. Jesus says the exact same opposite. This man wasted the one talent he's been given. Take it from him and give it to the man who will at least use it. Sometimes when we take money, from the rich and we give it to the poor, it ends up not being good for society because the rich person is spending it and giving other people jobs. The poor person may blow it on drugs or alcohol or a lot of, I'm not trying to say all poor people are that way, but sometimes people have according to their ability. And if you take from the one who has earned money and saved money and give it to someone else who hasn't earned it, they may be tending to waste it. So here, this doesn't make sense at first, but the rich do get richer, for it does say here, to everyone who has more will be given. Why? Because they are using it according to ability. And so we see here, uh, the rich do get richer because if you want something done, give it to a busy person, but give it to someone who's responsible. And so he'll use his opportunity to invest it rather than waste it. And this is a wise financial decision. He says, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Now, is he talking about sending this man to jail? Is he talking about sending him to hell, weeping and gnashing of teeth? Well, in the end, we are saved not because of what we do with our talents. We are saved because of the grace of Jesus. But our judgment will be based upon what we do with what he's given to us as forgiven sinners. And so here, it's not talking about losing one's salvation. If you are saved, it is not because you were wise, because you were faithful, it's because you had faith in Christ. But what do we do with the opportunity that God has given us? We don't want to be the one talent guy. We may be a one talent guy, a one talent girl, but we need to be like the five and the two talent ones who invest it. Even if you only have one talent, you can invest it in God's field and double it. The point of this story Jesus wants his disciples to know, and he wants you and I to know, that his delay is our opportunity. And we're not to sit and mourn that he's gone, or stand up on the hillside and wait for him to return. He has not deserted us. Like these three stewards, he has trusted us with his assets, with his Holy Spirit, with his power. And he has given us, in his delay, an opportunity to shine, to be faithful, and to invest in people, and to invest in his kingdom. We say, we don't have enough time. We're on the clock. We need more time. He's given us enough time. We have 24 hours in this day, and however long he gives us, we want to be faithful like the first two stewards. And Jesus warns his disciples, and he warns us, 
don't waste your opportunity. It's like a soccer game where there is a clock, but nobody knows except for the referee how much time is left. God's the one holding the clock. Jesus may come back any day. We don't know, but we have to be ready. We have to be faithful because he may not come in 10,000 years and he may come today. But either way, we need to be faithful. And from this story, we need to remember not only to invest wisely, not to bury our talents, but we also need to be faithful and to serve God. One more study next week. Join us, please.